Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 693. Today we're going to take a look at Glenmore 2 Chronicles. Now this is the follow-up sequel reimagining of the original Glenmore, also designed by Matthias Kramer. And that original game came out about 10 years ago now. Now this is largely the same game at its core, but there are definite refinements and changes to that core system. But on top of the changes to the core, there's also the little Chronicles piece to it. And what this does is it includes basically eight different little modules or expansions that you can plug and play into uh, the main game. You could use one module or no modules or a couple of modules or all the modules. And I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> but uh, So you can kind of mix and match that up uh, with the game. Now what I'm going to show you here is going to be kind of the main core game. I will talk, of course, about the Chronicles. I've played most of them, or maybe about half of them, actually. And But I'm going to show you the core game, and kind of a little bit of a spoiler. The core game by itself is kind of worth it. You don't necessarily need all those expansions. Um, but we'll talk more about that in the review. So that's why I want to kind of present the core game so you get a good sense of that if you're not familiar with the original. And see if, the, if, if that's not good enough by itself, the expansions don't do that much different to it, but let's that's a little bit there's a little bit more nuance to that. So Glenmore 2 takes place in Scotland. And you can see here theoretically a Scottish citizen looking over uh, the Highlands. When you open the box, you're gonna have to build these little boxes for the Chronicles. But thankfully the box insert has a place to put all the components and tokens and nicely pack away each of the various modules and keep those pieces separate so that when you come back to the game, you can choose again to kind of plug and play which of these little modules or expansions that you want to use. Each of the modules or expansions is known as a chronicle. So think of them like a little book that you'll crack open and kind of peek into various times in Scottish history or Scottish lore or myth. And you will kind of, again, plug and play or pick and choose what you want to sort of flavorize your game with. And so the way that the mechanics sort of interact with the core game is going to be very interesting. Now it's kind of an abstract sort of tenuous uh, smattering of theme, but it does give you the flavor of different periods of Scottish history. And each of the chronicles is designed by different uh, designers. For example, Klaus Jürgen Reed is designed one of the expansions. He's the designer of Carcassonne. And there's just several in here from sort of well-known designers as well as lesser known designers. So let me give you a general sense of the gameplay. Now to start the game, each player is going to get a, a little village of two tiles, as well as workers in their particular color with little tiny banners of their particular color, sort of indicating a Scottish house, and then a various amount of money based on where you are in turn order. In addition to each player's kind of individual village, which they'll be building up over the course of the game, there's two main boards. On the right here, you can see a bunch of tiles and little workers. This is the rondelle, which I'll talk about more in a minute. On the left, you have the clan board. And on this board, this is where players will be placing their little banners uh, through actions that they'll take on the rondelle board. And you'll get various rewards and special abilities as you sort of claim these different areas and villages and towns. Now, the meat of the action, of course, is on this rondelle board. And this is the, really the small piece of genius that was in the original game. And of course, it carries over to this one is whoever is kind of last in a turn order, so in this case the purple player, is going to leap up, land on the tile of their choosing, and then pay any cost maybe associated with the tile if there is any, and then grab that tile and add it to their village. So they'll take that tile off of the board, they'll have to place it adjacent to one of their workers that's currently in their village, and then after placing the tile, they're gonna activate the tile they just placed as well as all the tiles around it. So on this particular turn, we're going to activate the tile we just took, which is gonna generate a sheep for us to spend later. And then the tiles around it currently are these two village tiles, which allow you to make two movements with your workers. So for example, we might just move this worker over to the right. Now in a future turn, I might grab this tile that generates wood for us and we'll place that down. And again, the tile that we acquired will trigger its own action, generating wood, and then all the tiles around it. So the sheep tile that we got on the previous turn will also kick in again and generate another sheep, as well as now we've got one movement for our purple worker. So the combination of those two mechanics that I just showed you, the sort of time track rondelle where you're jumping up and grabbing a tile to add to your little tableau, your village, and then setting up that sort of proximity combo thing 
is really the greatness of this game, and it was the greatness of the original as well. Now, I've seen those mechanics in different games where you have this sort of time track where if you jump up too far, then people might come behind you and then they might get multiple actions. But maybe it was worth it jumping up that far because there's that really juicy tile that everybody wants or maybe a particular opponent wants that you really need to get before they do. And sort of balancing those two actions together and then trying to figure out sort of adjacency wise and proximity wise where to sort of align those things and then get your workers moved around and all that kind of stuff. That's just really sings as a mechanic and it's just something that with all the expansions just makes it super flexible to add new tiles in, add new combos and all that kind of thing. Now you're not only going to uh, generate resources of course for the tiles, you're going to be also to trade those resources in for points or get money or these other things. Or you might get some that just generate victory points or generate whiskey barrels, which is like a special kind of resource in this game. And of course there are other types of tiles here if we can see Castle Stalker. In the lower left hand side of this tile there's a little card icon which means that there's a card that accompanies this tile when you acquire it. So you can see you, you got to pay a wood, a stone, and a cow and then you can get this tile along with a new worker and this card and this particular card is very simple it just gives you three money. And there's a whole little stack of cards that come out uh, with the various tiles as they come out through the game. And these tiles are usually pretty sought after because they'll have some kind of extra little combo along with whatever the tile might do by itself. Finally, there are person tiles and you're not going to add these to your village. You're just going to set them off to the side. But you can see the little clan marker token thing in the bottom left hand corner. And what these tiles are telling you is that you get to add one of your clan markers to the clan board. And this is another interesting uh, new thing. This was not in the original game whatsoever. And what happens when you trigger this is you're going to be able to place one of your clan tokens out. And you're going to start from this sort of uh, wilderness area here and then draw a line out to where you want to place it. You can place it wherever you want, but if you cross any of the tokens that have money, you've got to pay money for each of those that you might jump across. So in this example here, Red went to this particular spot. They got a new worker to add to their village as they also got some wheat to add to their village. If on a later turn, Purple got a person tile, they can start from either the wilderness area or start drawing a line from any clan token, their own or an opponent. And if they wanted to go to this next spot over here, Monroe, they would just have to pay the one coin to jump over there and then trigger that special ability. So I'm gonna talk more about this board uh, in the review part, but this is something that I was very lukewarm on. It, it felt like a very big kind of bolt on to the original core game. Uh, but after several more plays of it, uh, I've really, really started to enjoy what this board adds to the game. But I'll talk more about that in the review at the end. Now, one other cool mechanic that is in the original game is this market space kind of in the middle of the rondelle here. Now, you can see this is set up here for each of the five different resources. We've got a dollar on each of those. Now, on your turn, at any time, you can buy and sell various resources. And this works... <laughs> And this market works as a very cool kind of supply and demand type of thing. So let's say I had some extra wheat. I could sell that wheat, get the dollar that's on the board, and then I can use that to buy maybe a brick and pay two bucks and put that two dollars right onto the board and get that brick. Now you don't ever do this to sort of hoard resources. Only when you go to uh, satisfy some requirement, whether to buy a tile or turn in resources for points, instead of spending that actual resource, if you don't have it, you can just theoretically just kind of spend money as if you were getting that resource. So you don't buy the resources to keep them, you buy them to fulfill uh, some kind of spend requirement. Uh, but the way that the money kind of fluctuates there on that board, it's just a really cool thing, because if there is no money left on a resource, there's no, there's no demand, so you can't sell it. And if it's full up, if you've got one, two, and then three money on one of the resources, then there's no way to buy any because the, the market is, is tapped out. So that kind of fluctuating supply and demand thing is just a nice little, you know, very easy to read kind of wrinkle to it. and just adds a little bit more bite and crunch to the core game. So players are gonna keep jumping up, taking tiles, adding them to their village, you know, throwing up different combos, trying to collect points, collect various different resources and things. And you're gonna have a scoring at the end of kind of four phases. So as you draw through these piles of tiles, A, B, C, and D, you're gonna score once you flip over the last tile from each of the different 
So you're gonna have four scorings at the end of A, B, and C. Now in the D stack, there's a tile in the middle, it's called the end of the world tile. That will trigger like the last few rounds of the game and then the players will get some more turns and then we'll have a final scoring. And you're always gonna score four different sort of categories. The first one you can see here on the left is whoever has the most workers inside their main castle. Then you're gonna compare who has the most cards then you're gonna compare who has the most whiskey barrels and then compare who has the most person tiles. And you're gonna look at yourself and your count. Let's, let's just talk whiskey barrels. Let's say there's three players. I've got three whisker, whiskey barrels. Billy has two and Francesca has zero. So I'm gonna compare myself to whoever has the least. So I have three more than the least. I have three, Francesca has zero. So I'm gonna get three points. Billy has two more than the least person, so he's gonna get two points. Now if I had five or more than whoever had the least, I would get eight points. And you're gonna do that for all four categories. And you're gonna do that four times throughout the game. And then finally, at the end of the game, each coin you have is gonna be worth a victory point. And each tile you have in excess of whoever has the least is you're gonna lose three points. So the way that this works is let's say you build out your village and at the end I have 14 tiles and Francesca has 10 tiles and Billy has 11. So Francesca's safe because she's got the least amount of tiles because she's theoretically been the most efficient with her use of the tile. So I have four more tiles than Francesca. I'm gonna lose three times four, so I'm gonna lose 12 points at the end of the game. Now Billy only has one more than Francesca. He's only gonna lose three points at the end of the game. So that's the gist of the game. I just wanted to make a quick special note here of kind of my two favorite uh, chronicles so far. Now I've not played them all, but these two I really, really like. But I would actually never mix these two in the same game. The first one is the first chronicle, which is a dragon boat race. And the second is Old Jamie's Single Cask Reserve. So that's the general gist of how you play Glenmore 2 Chronicles. And there's a lot of more kind of details in some of the special abilities of the tiles and the cards and obviously the Chronicles as well uh, that really are gonna layer on a lot of meat on the bones of that core system. Uh, so let's kind of go through my three pillars of reviews here. Now I've had a chance to play this with two, three, and four players and that's, that's the player count. Uh, I don't think it really matters to me which player count. I love all three, four player, all three player counts, two, three, and four. <laughs> so in a two, and if you choose to, in a three player game, you also have this dice that you will roll and kind of act as a dummy player that will jump forward a number of spaces equal to the roll and just kind of discard tiles out of the game. And it's very simple to use. You just roll the dice, jump up, up, up throw the tile in the discard pile, and it's gone. Now there are special abilities to actually grab and build tiles out of the discard pile. So it's not gone for good, uh, and it actually makes those tiles worth a little bit more when you do use the dice because more stuff is getting discarded, so there might be more juicy tiles that are in there that maybe players wanted. Uh, so I like that, so it's fine. It's not really, I mean, it's the same as if somebody else took the tile, so it's not really like screwing anybody over. You're taking a risk if, you really want that next tile and the die has a good shot of rolling a one and moving one space right in front of you. So you, you've got to know that uh, going into it. Now they have removed the five player count from this game, which was in the original. And I was kind of of two minds about that because I really did enjoy the other Glenmore also with five players. It's a much tighter, uh, much, not really meaner game. It's just a little bit more difficult of a game because there's more people gobbling up and eating all the tiles and taking the stuff that you want. So for example, if I'm kind of going down the whiskey route and you're going down the route to grab cards as well as the workers kind of thing, then we can kind of play away from each other, but there'll be opportunities where we do get each other's way. But the more players you add, you, if you have like two people going for whiskey, then you're gonna run into each other a lot more. So adding that fifth player, you know, that's just, you know, ratcheting it up 100 degrees there. I don't really miss it though, because there's enough kind of going on here with the Chronicles and the extra clan board and all that stuff that with five players it probably would just be extra messy. And I've heard complaints you know, even from my own group that five players, they don't really like it because it's just, it's a little bit too tight and, and uh, there's not enough breathing room there. Uh, so that's player count. I'd, honestly, two, three, four, I would play any of those any time of the day. As far as the time to play the game, now that's gonna kind of vary based on how much you've played it and also how much you've played some of the Chronicles uh, that can get added to the game. Some of the Chronicles will add more time than others. Some will kind of just seamlessly 
just integrate with the game and not really add any time other than a little bit of crunch in terms of like, hmm, what should I do? Because I've now I can do this other thing, you know, with the Chronicle. Uh, but the overall time to play the game, I would say anywhere between probably 45 minutes at the minimum, even with two players, up to about an hour and a half or so with four players. Now, if it's new people at the table, I could kind of see the four player game getting up maybe towards two hours. It kind of depends on you know, on your group, I think, but really shouldn't go any longer than an hour and a half. And I don't think you can really get it down under 45 minutes, to be fair. You might be able to get a two player game done in a half an hour. I could see that happening. But then for me, I think I'd actually be playing a little too quick. And this game, it can kind of lull you into that because it's such like an easy breezy thing where it's like, jump up, take the tile, add it, trigger all these cool combos around me, your turn. And you really have to think about what the other players are doing and when you make that decision to go up and grab a tile, you're like, this is great for me. Boom, take it. You might be ignoring something that would be pretty good for you, but really great for your opponent. And you should be taking that <laughs> because they're going to just, you know, go home to the bank with all the points they're going to generate off of the little combos that they're setting up. So that's the player count and the play time. Now, my comparison thing is obviously going to be to uh, the original. And uh, as I kind of said during the walkthrough, I've not really seen this melding of mechanics other than the original, and then he had kind of an offshoot game, I can't remember the name of it, Stronghold published it. It's about car racing or car building or something. And it had that kind of Rondell thing where you jumped around the track buying tiles and things like that. Uh, but this kind of, and then there was like a knockoff Glenmore or something. I don't remember the name of that one either. Uh, but this one just sings. It just sings all the way through. Because the thing is, is it's so easy, in my opinion, to get in and just start playing around and having fun and jumping up and getting tiles and doing combos and generating resources and selling off these extra resources that you get because you're full of this resource and that resource. It's just so easy and buttery to get into. And then it, it, this has layers and layers and layers of strategic depth um, uh, the more you play it. And that really just gets multiplied with all of these different chronicles. So the one thing I want to talk about though is let's talk about the differences of, of Glenn Moore. Because in my opinion, like I said towards the beginning, if you just wanted to play this core game as is, then I think it's probably almost worth the money because I think you can get this in stores for about 80 bucks, which is a lot for this kind of sort of weight and design of a game probably. Uh, but the components and everything as you can see here are, are stellar. So you are in the insert in the boxes and it's just that extra extravagance. So I think in that terms, it's probably worth that amount of money. You know, it feels right. Money issues, that's always a weird thing to kind of talk about because if you're like a loaded millionaire, then like just whatever, buy it. But if you're broke and shouldn't be buying board games, then don't buy it. You know what I mean? So there's somewhere in between. Um, so I would say if you just wanted to get that core game, if that looks interesting to you, and you just wanted to play that, like I would still sit down and just play the core game right now, even though I've played some of these extra Chronicles. And that's that's good enough. Now when you add on all this extra stuff, and it's basically like piling in, I don't know, two or three expansions worth of stuff, because one module by itself is not really, I would say worth like an expansion box. Maybe two or three of them together would be something you would normally go out and get afterwards and get an expansion and then get the next one and the next one. So this probably, let's say it has two expansions worth of content into it. Um, and so I think what I've found with this, um, in, again, what like I said before, is that extra clan board. The one thing that that does kind of remove from the game is the accessibility to new players and newer gamers because it's a lot it's a big old let me just grab it here it's a big old kind of board to digest there's a lot of you know little special abilities and things that you can do and little pathways to try to figure out you know what you can get out of it now you could and i've thought about this and not tried it as one option you can always select to just get three points it's kind of at the bottom there you don't actually have to uh, you know use uh, the map to get to that you can just say i'll just take the three points so you could as an intro play the game if you've got like a more casual type of crowd and say whenever you get a person tile you get the person tile which you're going to score at the end and it's also going to be worth three points when you take it that could be all right as a, as a learning game because there's enough here for a newer gamer in that main rondelle aspect and building their village and all that stuff to get into i mean that's basically what the original game was is 
this minus the clan board. Now, I've grown to really adore this and I have had the chance to play this with the family. So the more that we've played with it, the more accessible and interesting this clan board uh, has become. And the kind of balancing between adding something to your village and to your engine and jumping out here onto that board and getting something else that maybe your engine is not providing you, probably at the cost of spending some money to go down on one of these pads, is a very kind of interesting dichotomy. And it really kind of just doubles down on the whole jump aspect of the game where you're gonna, I'm gonna jump up two, three, five tiles, get to something that's really good, and bypass this other stuff that I, you know, I could use but I don't want other players getting this and taking this from me because it's vital to my engine. And so maybe you might jump up and, and get something that's, you know, work in this little corner of your village, but maybe you've, you've neglected like getting some sheep or some cows for stuff that's gonna come in in the B and the C and the D stack that you're gonna wanna make use of. So this gives you kind of an out in a way to go ahead and get that little extra trigger or jump up even in this case because some of these special abilities here are late, kind of further away from the beginning of this are little triggers that you can get and you'll get little tokens that will allow you to do you know trade money like uh, buy resources for always getting uh, for always one buck and all this other stuff and so there's some other abilities that you might want to take a leap out to and get that and then have that active for the whole game now they're a little bit ways in so you know if you do them too early you're gonna be spending a lot of money to get over there but if you do them too late then you're not gonna be able to make use of those abilities for more often so the impact of them is going to be a lot less so it, that pairs nicely with the whole jumping up far in the rondelle so you, you there's a real give and take like do i jump up this far and then on the clan board do i you know go down the path this far and so that again that just it's the same kind of vibe but with a kind of a different mechanic there so i've really come to enjoy how this works and everything uh, so, and like I said, the run, the uh, Chronicles really add a lot to it. Now, I have my favorites. I mentioned the two, number one, and it was the other one, number three. Yeah. But I don't want to mix those. I've mixed the first two, the river one, and then there's like this mountain thing uh, where you put this on the track, and then as you sort of jump over, you have to drop off. It's almost like a little tax, and you have to drop off goods. So if somebody wants to just land on it, they're foregoing getting a tile and doing something, you know, for their engine, but they might get all the goods that everybody else dropped off at. You might get your goods back too if you keep going around it. So that those are two very simple ones, the river and the the riverboat race and that one. Um, but I played with the the Jamie's whiskey one as well as there's a one where you have these like haggis tokens. And it's this whole little mini game of haggis tokens, and you can score so many points out of that. Um, but the, if you add too many expansions to it, too many of these modules, the whole give and take thing, the whole jumping up and weighing the options of, of how far to jump and everything and how far to go down one path versus the other. Because if you go down way whiskeys, but everybody else is you know, raking up points on you on the cards and the villagers, who, oh great, you got eight points for your whiskey, but everybody else scored like you know, 16 points off of everything else that you were neglecting. So it's that whole tug of, tug of war kind of thing with yourself. Uh, if you add too much of that, into the game. So if I add the whiskey and the haggis and the river, it's like, well, I don't know what to do. Like there's just so much. So I think you really only want to add one, maybe two of the Chronicles together uh, because otherwise you're, everybody's going to be spread really thin and there are just going to be certain actions and strategies that are just going to be better when you add too much in. So the haggis strategy is is this is the example is the hack strategy is going to decimate the rest of the game and everybody should just do that because you can get so many points out of it now if everybody's aware of that then you can kind of give and take and balance up that but it's always something you it will always be keeping you in check now if it's just by itself that's okay it'll integrate more seamlessly with the rest of the game and flow a little bit better but i don't want to say never throw the kitchen sink in there because i think as you play the game more and more those kind of wacky combinations are going to add to the replayability for people that get really experienced and have played the game, you know, a dozen or so or more times. And so that's not something I would shy away from. It's just something I wouldn't recommend like out the gate, just to be a little bit more clear about that. Uh, but yeah, I, everything is just great about this game. The production, you know, uh, the ability to kind of plug and play all this different stuff and add variety within the kind of the same self-contained box. 
And But really I come back to kind of my original statement at the start of the video was, it's so simple and buttery and easy to get into. Jump up, grab a tile, put it in your village, do all the cool combos that you're gonna inevitably do over the course of the game. And then as your village kind of grows up, those combos are gonna go away. Oh, but there's one other thing that this game added over the original. And that is, now you have some tiles that will build on top of other tiles. Because in the original, as your village kind of grew, that center area became dead because there's nothing that you can sort of attach that's next to it. Like, if you have a tile that's completely surrounded by other tiles, that tile's never getting activated again. But, unless there's a special ability, which there's a couple. But now you have these tiles that you build over the top and that will trigger that kind of inner village area. So that stuff will kind of get reused. So that adds another kind of fresh dynamic to this. And that's a real interesting uh, part to this. But again, sorry, I meant to mention that and I was like, don't forget to mention the overbuild tiles. But like I said, the buttery silkiness of the simple game of jump up, grab a tile, generate resources, trade in resources for points, whatever. And then once you know kind of like the deck or the stack of the tiles and all the different cards and abilities, then you can be like, oh, okay, so I should, I know that these whiskey ones are gonna start coming out more frequently. Or I know at the end of the game, some of the ones that are castles that are associated with the cards, they do a lot of really cool stuff. So I wanna be in a good position to kind of be and a spot where I can buy those are the markets as they get better. And those are the tiles that you can like generate and sell your resources for points. I know those are coming later. So there is a long-term planning. And so there's a randomness at the end of the line of the tiles that you can grab, but there's several out there. So you can see, oh, okay, so maybe I got a turn or two to get to that. But somebody might just say, oh, there's the Loch Ness monster or whatever it is, and I'm gonna jump up and all the way and grab it. And then like everybody's like, oh, because you know they just jumped the entire line of tiles. So anyway, really cool game, really great game. Definitely replaces the original, obviously. And uh, like I said, I played this with my gamer group right before the lockdown and you know, recently with my family and stuff. And it's been a hit across the board with everybody. So the silky smoothness with the extra strategy and then all those layers of expansions just make it easy to recommend this game if you like Euros. So definitely take a look at Glenmore too. Thanks.